is a revelation from Almighty Allah and Islam is the religion acceptable to Allah and Islam is the only religion that teaches man what is justice and what is injustice how can a true Muslim commit atrocities even against enemies when the glorious Quran says in chapter 5 verse 8 let not your hatred make you depart from justice and commit atrocities if you want real peace and tranquility justice and progress we have to turn to Islam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to this exciting evening at the Dubai International Peace Convention aiming global unity through peace. At the Dubai International Peace Convention, our attractions include the conference, Salvation, the International Islamic Exhibition, Kids Corner, Bazaar, quiz competitions, and many more. Of all the huge amount of people entering today, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this land wide for us to accommodate as many people as possible so we all can be benefited with the lectures of our esteemed speakers. As a proceeding to our event, our next speaker is Advocate Mayan Kuti Maher, a senior advocate of the Kerala High Court and deals with civil and tax related matters. Being a practicing advocate, he has always taken out time for the cause of Islam. Interestingly, a born Muslim, but had an atheist ideology. But that was only until 1995 when things started changing for the good. And advocate Mayan Kuti entered into the mainstream of Islam and has been serving this peaceful way of life ever since. Please welcome our next speaker, Advocate Mayan Kuti Mathur, for his talk on the topic, No Islam, No Peace. That's K-N-O-W, No Islam, K-N-O-W, No Peace. Advocate Mayan Kuti Mathur. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabihi al faizina bidilallah wa man ahsanu kawla mi man daa ilallah wa amila swali hamma kala in the name in al muslimin. Dear brothers and sisters, Aslamu alaikum, may peace and blessings from Almighty Allah. The one and only Creator be bestowed upon you. Once a dad scolded his little son for tearing the picture of a world map to many small pieces. With tears filled eyes, the little boy left the room. After some time, the dad was amazed to find that the little boy had pasted the torn pieces of the world map at the right place. All the continents and countries were at the right position. The amazed dad asked him, 
Son, how could you manage to do this? The little boy, with all innocence, said, Dad, there was a picture of a man on the back of the world map. I put the man right, and the world was all right. The philosophy contained in those innocent words speak volumes about the responsibility of man. If man behaves in a responsible manner, the world would be a better place to live in. But unfortunately, man himself is the problem for all conflicts and other disturbances. Man himself is responsible for the tribulations and sufferings. Man himself is responsible for the discontentment and conflicts. Modern man who boasts that one day he would control the universe, make the stars dance to his tune, play with planets, and may even control aging and overcome death has become so arrogant and thoughtless. He himself is a threat to the environment. He has no scruples to pollute water, land and atmosphere. He cheats his own brother and ruthlessly slashes his throat. He invents weapons of mass destruction and drops nuclear bombs to kill millions. He has no concern for his fellow beings and future generations to be born. And this attitude is going to have devastating effect on human life. If we sincerely desire that this tragedy should not occur, if we do not want deadly viruses and nuclear weapons to obliterate human race from the surface of the globe, if we do not want disintegrated families, if we do not want our youth to be drug addicts, if we do not want to face the agony and frustration of children born out of marriages, if we do not want prostitution to be the major trade in our cities, if we do not want our kids to go to schools with guns and shoot their teachers and classmates, then we have to change ourselves. And the change should come immediately before it is too late. It will be too late to amend the ways after the earth and sun are contaminated with atomic toxic waste. After the earth is shrouded by dark clouds which make it difficult to distinguish between days and nights. After all the water on earth has turned to poisonous gas. And after all species of living beings have disappeared. Then there is no meaning in changing because nothing will be left to be changed. So we have to change. There cannot be two opinion about that. But when we speak about change, naturally one might ask, where should we begin? According to my opinion, the change should occur in the minds of individuals. Because individuals make family, and families make society, and societies make the country, and the countries make the whole world. So everything begins from individual. How can transformation, refinement and purification occur in the minds of individuals? It can occur only if he is convinced about his creator. If he is convinced that the creator has created him for a specific purpose. And after his death, he will be resurrected. And will be given reward for their good deeds and punishment for his sins. Unless and until man is convinced about this, there cannot be real transformation in his mind. And Islam is the only religion that teaches man. What is right and what is wrong? What is justice and what is injustice? What is morality and what is immorality? And Islam is the only religion that directs man, his responsibility towards the Creator and to himself, towards his wife and kids, towards his parents and relatives, and towards his fellow beings and nature. But unfortunately, Prejudice critics and media and even prominent personalities of other religions deliberately try to malign our dear Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa 
to prevent people from reading the Quran and accepting Islam. They propagate that Muhammad was an imposter who pretended that he is a messenger of Allah for personal and material gains. There is not a shadow of doubt in it. There is not a shadow of truth in it. I repeat, there is not a shadow of truth in it. We know of people who claim that they are God or God's men. We know of people who claimed that they are sons of God and incarnations of God, who had claimed that they have got divine powers and can bring good and evil to people, who had claimed that they can predict the future, perform miracles and cure illness. Our dear messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never claimed that he is God or son of God. He never claimed that is, he has got divine powers or can bring good and evil to people. He never claimed that he can predict the future, perform miracles and cure diseases on his own. He never told anybody to paint his picture and garland it. He never told anybody to erect his idol and worship it. On the contrary, he told them to pray for him and for his family. He told them he's first the servant of God and then the messenger of God. And on his deathbed, with tear-filled eyes, our dear Prophet pray to Almighty Allah. O oh Allah, my followers, Muslims, should not attribute divinity to me. They should not call me God as Christians are doing about Jesus Christ. And when death was near him, he did not pray to save him from his illness. He did not pray to give him a longer life. On the contrary, he prayed to Allah, O oh Allah, my grave should not be made an idol of worship. Allahumma la taj al kabri wathanan yu'bad. If he was a false prophet, he would not have done that. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted a son. And Allah blessed him with a son. He was named Ibrahim. But Ibrahim died when he was one and a half years. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam carried the little boy in his hands and said, Oh Ibrahim, I am so sad about your death. My eyes are filled with tears and my heart is filled with grief. Still I will not utter a word against you. On that day there was an eclipse. And people thought that the eclipse occurred because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's son died. Naturally they attributed divinity on him. The Prophet could have utilized this as a golden opportunity to claim divinity. He could have told them, yes, the eclipse occurred because my son died. But the Prophet did not say that. Even when his heart was filled with grief, he went to people and told them, look, this eclipse is a natural phenomenon. And all natural phenomena are creation of God. And it has got nothing to do with the death of my son. If he was a false prophet, he would not have said so. And what material gains did Prophet made out of his prophethood? When prior to his prophethood, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a rich man, a happily married man, and a successful trader. But after becoming the prophet of Allah, after getting revelations, and after people started recognizing him as a prophet, he had to suffer undescribable persecution and agony. He had to flee his homeland and live as a refugee in a distant land. And after the Meccan victory, when he was the uncrowned emperor of Arabia, undisputed spiritual leader, and one of the greatest command of the time, he led a very ordinary life. He mended his shoes and stitched his dress. He swept the floor, kindled the fire, milked the goat. His food was dates and water, and he slept on palm leaves. The house from where the light was spread throughout the world was in darkness because there was no oil in the lamp. And once, his dear daughter Fatima approached the Prophet and said, Dad, look at my hands, it is full of bruises, doing household work. Look at my shoulders, they are marks carrying buckets full of water. Look at my dress, it is full of dirt and soil. So kindly give me a servant. Even this genuine request 
of his dear daughter was refused by our dear prophet. And the garment in which he breathed his last was torn and had many patches. And on the day he died, the only remainings were a few coins apart when to satisfy a debt and the remaining was given to a person who came for help. And at the age of 62, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left the world, the world was at his feet, but not a dinar to his credit. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Still critics allege he was a false prophet. Why? In order to prevent people from reading Quran and accepting Islam, the glorious Quran was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was an illiterate. Yes, a person who did not know how to read and write, who did not know anything about embryology, science, history, or any branches of law. But when he came out of the cave of Hira, at the age of 40, people were amazed to find him speaking the most profound Arabic language that took the masters of Arabic literature by surprise. The person who did not know anything about embryology started to speak about sperm, ovum, different stages of embryo which cannot be seen with our naked eye. The person who did not know anything about astronomy, geology, etc. started speaking about the formation of the universe, nebulae, stars, and formation of mountains, etc. He told us about the darkness in the depth of deep oceans which was witnessed by human beings only decades back when man visited the bottoms of deep oceans using sophisticated submarines. The person who did not know anything about law taught us about great principles of law, including eternal principles of human rights such as equality of man and equality before law, right to life and freedom of faith, right to preserve one's own honor and dignity, right to protect one's own life and property, etc. And these principles we can find in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by United Nations in 1948. The person who did not know anything about history told us that the body of the cruel dictator Pharaoh of Egypt has been preserved by Almighty God as a sign and warning for future generations. And since one century back, the mummified body of Pharaoh Ramses II, the contemporary of Prophet Moses salam, was identified by the archaeologists. And what should we understand from this? Are these the words? of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the words of God the prophet told us these are not my words these are the words of almighty Allah why should we doubt it when even the most learned philosophers intellectuals historians social reformers cannot give us a book like the Noble Quran. Why should we doubt him? Then even the bitter enemy of the Prophet called him Al-Amin, the trustworthy, who never lies. Yes, without doubt. Quran is a revelation from Almighty Allah. And Islam is the religion acceptable to Allah. Inna dina in the lahil Islam. Still, the critics the media and even prominent personalities of other religions allege that Islam is a religion that propagates terrorism and extremism, forces Islam on non-Muslims and encourages Muslims to explore themselves in the middle of a crowd of innocent people. The truth is far from this. How can a true Muslim kill innocent people when the glorious Quran says in chapter 5 verse 32, Man katala nafsam bighayri nafsin naw fasadin fil arli fa ka'annama katala nasa jamiya wa man ahyaha fa ka'annama ahya nasa jamiya except for murder or committing atrocities. Killing an innocent person is equivalent to murdering the entire humanity and saving an innocent life is equivalent to saving the entire humanity. How can a true Muslim commit atrocities even against enemies when the glorious Quran says in chapter 5 verse 8, let not your hatred make you depart from justice and commit atrocities. How can a true Muslim say that 
he will force Islam on others when the glorious Quran says in chapter 2 verse 256 let there be no compulsion in religion truth stands out clear from error how can a true Muslim deny freedom of faith to non-Muslims when the glorious Quran says in chapter 76 verse 3 we have shown him two ways either he can be grateful or ungrateful how can a true Muslim say that he will not tolerate other religions apart from Islam and the glorious Quran says in chapter 6 verse 108 When the Holy Quran says in chapter 106 verse 8 Lakum deenukum waliyadeen To you be your religion and for me mine how can a true Muslim make fun of things or persons worshipped by non-Muslims when the glorious Quran says in chapter 6 verse 108 You should not make fun of things or persons worshipped by others. How can a true Muslim destroy the places of worship belonging to non-Muslims when the glorious Quran says in chapter 22 verse 40 If Allah has not prevented certain persons through others, synagogues, churches, monasteries and masjids where Allah's name is praised would have been destroyed. How can a true Muslim deny justice to non-Muslims when the exalted scripture, the Quran says in chapter 60 verse 8, Allah does not prevent Muslims from doing justice. Allah loves those who do justice. Once a Muslim, namesake Muslim, concealed a stolen article in the house of a Jew and accused him of stealing. And hearing the eloquent arguments of the Muslim, the Prophet thought that the Jew is guilty and the Muslim is innocent. At the time, Almighty Allah, who understands our hidden thoughts, revealed verse 105 of chapter 4 where Allah stated, O Muhammad, we have sent you with guidance to deal justly between people and not to side with wrongdoers. How can a true believer of this great scripture do injustice to non-Muslims? And how can a true Muslim explore himself in the middle of an innocent crowd by committing suicide when the glorious Quran says in chapter 4 verse 29 you should not kill yourself how can a true Muslim ignore the sayings of our dear Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about a particular person who fought gallantly on the side of Muslims and when he was wounded and could not endure the pain he plunged his sword into his belly and he killed himself the Prophet said because he killed himself he lost paradise and he will be in hellfire. How can true Muslims ignore the serious warnings of dear Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the person who commits suicide by leaping from mountains will be in hell and there he will be constantly leaping from heights and eternally suffering the torments of falling from heights. The person who kills himself by consuming poison will be in hell. And there he will be constantly consuming poison and eternally suffering the agony. The person who kills himself by thrusting sharp weapons into his body will be in hell. And there he will be constantly thrusting sharp weapons into his body. How can a true Muslim commit atrocities even during times of war, fought as a defense? When Abu Bakr Allah when who? following the footsteps of our dear Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised Usama radiallahu anhu the commander in chief that even during times of war fought in defense you should not kill innocent people you should not harm women children and age you should not cut trees destroy crops and you should not disturb those who meditate in the monasteries how can a true Muslim justify the wrongs committed by namesake Muslims when the Prophet defined communalism by stating when your community does a wrong and if you do not say it is wrong then it is communalism how can a Muslim fight for communalism when the scholar said those who invite to communalism die for communalism and fight for communalism do not belong to us and we have to agree and admit there are a minuscule misguided minority among the Muslim community 
who stand against this who commits lots of atrocities but how can you call them Muslim terrorists and how can you attribute the deeds in the account of Islam nobody called and nobody calls Adolf Hitler who killed large number of innocent people as a Christian terrorist no one calls Mussolini who committed grave atrocities on humanity as a Christian Mussolini no one calls the fighting groups in Ireland as a Roman Catholic terrorist or Protestant terrorist no one calls the Serbs of Yugoslavia who killed innocent Muslims raped Muslim women slaughtered Muslim children merely because they were Muslims as Orthodox Christian Serb terrorists I will never call them Christian terrorists because I believe that they were not acting according to the principles of Christianity similarly before calling a particular person a Muslim terrorist and attributing the deeds in the account of Islam a duty is cast upon us to judge whether these people were acting according to the principles of Islam still the media says jihad and jihadis are the greatest threat to human peace and mankind these people do not know what is jihad the word jihad is derived from the root word jihada which means to strive to work hard and the word for war is kitalun the glorious Quran says in chapter 25 verse 52 do the greatest jihad with the Quran we all know that the Quran is not a bomb a missile or a gun then what does it mean to do jihad with the Quran it means to live according to the principles of Quran jihad means to accept the one and only creator worship him and him alone pray to him and him alone and not to associate anything or anyone with him Jihad means to love the messengers, believe in the last day, in the judgment day, and, and in the world hereafter. Jihad means to pray, to give zakat, to perform hajj. Jihad means not to kill innocent people, not to commit adultery, not to indulge in homosexual relations, not to cheat, not to drink, not to gamble, not to speak ill of about women. Jihad means to speak the truth even at the face of a cruel dictator, to control one's own emotions. When your dear and near ones die or when you suffer from serious illness or financial setback Jihad means to be humble and not to be arrogant To be truthful not to lie To be fair and not to oppress To be trustworthy and not to betray To love and respect parents and not to be neglectful of them To honor agreements and not to break them To have good relations with kith and kin and not to breach family ties in short, jihad means to do all good deeds and refrain from committing sins. But there is one important aspect in jihad that is stated in glorious Quran, chapter 22, verses 39. That means, if God has permitted you to those to defend themselves because they have been wronged, War is fought against them and they have been driven out of their houses. Why should people oppose this right? When the same people support the right to defend one's own life and one's own property granted by all the penal laws in the world. Why should people oppose it? Those people who support the war fought by Sri Rama, the so-called Hindu God, to save his wife Sita from the illegal custody of Ravana. The very same people who supported the war led by Sri Krishna to save, to retrieve the Pandavas, the kingdom back, are opposing the right granted by the Quran to fight for a noble cause. When Arjuna refuses to fight, Sri Krishna advised Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 37. Arjuna, if you are killed, you will go to heaven if you're victorious you can enjoy the land either way get up and fight how can the very same people who support the words of Jesus Christ in gospel of Luke chapter 22 verse 36 support oppose the right granted by the glorious Quran to defend themselves when Jesus said sell your garments and buy swords there are times in our life when we should love there are times in our life when we should hate. 
There are times in our life when we should use force. There are times in our life when we should not use force. If you see a girl being raped and you, if you love the deed of rape in that circumstance, love is a sin and not a virtue. If you hate the deed of rape in that circumstance, hate is a virtue and not a sin. If you hesitate to use force to help the poor girl, your hesitation to use force is a sin and not a virtue. On the contrary, if you use force in that circumstance, your use of force is a virtue and not a sin. That is why the very same Quran which has taught us good and evil are not seen. Different evil with good then even the bitter enemy will become your dearest friend as also said. Why can't you defend for the weak and the oppressed? That is why Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who taught us the strongest person is not the one who defeats his enemy in a duel but the one who controls his emotions as also taught us. When you witness an atrocity try to prevent it with your hands. If that is not possible with your tongue. Even if that is not possible, at least hate it in your heart. Then the right to fight granted by Islam is the last resort and not a first action. And it cannot be decided by certain individuals or associations or organizations because the Noble Quran says in chapter 4 verse 59, you have to obey Allah, the messenger of Allah, and those in authority, that means the rulers. And we Muslims have got a duty cast upon us to ask those who have in, misinterpreted the great concept of jihad and committed atrocities and tarnished the image of Islam through your terrorist activities. How much innocent blood has been shed? How many innocent men, women and children have been slaughtered? How many children have been orphaned? How many parents have lost their dear children? How many women have become widows? How many have become crippled? How many have been rendered homeless? How many have become jobless? How many persons' hopes, dreams and aspirations have been shattered? And when the victims of your atrocities point their accusing fingers at you, and if you think on that day, on the judgment day, Allah and the glorious Quran will support you, you are totally mistaken. The verses in the Quran against atrocities will be the strongest evidence against you. Are you not afraid to meet Allah with the track record of your dreadful deeds? Are you not afraid to meet Allah swimming in the blood of innocent men, women and children? Are you not afraid to meet Allah bathing in the tears of parents who had lost their dear children of the widows who are destined for terrible hardship? Are you not afraid to meet Allah hearing the echoes of the screams of orphans who have been deprived of the love and affection of their parents. And when the victims of your atrocities point their accusing fingers at you, if you think Prophet will come as a witness in your favor, you are totally mistaken because the sayings of our dear Prophet, like La Yarhamullah Man La Yarhamun Nasa, Allah will not show mercy to you who do not show mercy to others. And Irhamu Man Filarli Yarhamukum Man Fisama. Show mercy to those on earth and Allah will show mercy to you will be the strongest and irrefutable evidence against you. Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance and all its teachings are relevant for all times. Once certain villagers approached Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked, do you kiss your children? The Prophet said, yes I do. The villagers said, God promised we do not do that. The Prophet looked at them and said, if Allah has removed mercy from your hearts, what can I do? And told them, you should not suppress your love and affection in your hearts, but should express it. This teaching has got great relevance. Few years back, a head of a company came home and called his nine-year-old son and said, son, a person gave me a gift today and told to give it to someone whom I love most. You know, I'm a busy man. I do not have much time to spend with you. 
Even the time I spent with you, I used to scold you. But you should understand one thing. You are the person whom I love most. The little boy stared at his dad for some time. Tears started rolling from his eyes. In the midst of weeping, he said, Dad, I thought you do not love me. I thought no one in this world loves me. I was thinking of committing suicide. Now I will never do it. His simple advice of Messenger of Allah see its relevance. And the Quran specifically teaches us that you should show love and affection, care and kindness towards your parents. But younger generations ignore this. Once a 22-year-old son and an aged father were sitting on the bench in a park. Due to old age, the memory of the father had started to fail. And when a sparrow came, the father asked, What is that? The son replied, it is a sparrow. After some time, dad asked again, what is that? The son replied, it's a sparrow, but he got irritated. After some time, the sparrow flew from that place and sat at, the, at another place. The dad stared at that place for some time and asked his son, what is that? The son got wild. How many times have to repeat it? It is a sparrow, it is a sparrow, it is a sparrow. The dad stared at his son for some time. He slowly got up. He walked to his house that was nearby. And when he was, he came back, he had an old diary in his hand. He told his son, when you were two years old, we were sitting on the same bench in the same park. And I had written about an incident that happened on that day. Kindly read it aloud. The son started to read. I was sitting with my two-year-old son on the bench in a park. A sparrow came. My son asked me, what is that? I replied, it is a sparrow. After some time, my son again asked, what is that? I replied, it is a sparrow. He asked the same question 22 times. And 22 times I answered, it is a sparrow. I never lost my temper. I never got angry. I never got irritated. Each time when he asked that question, appreciating his innocence, I embraced him and kissed him. After reading this, the son embraced his dad and apologized. But 1,400 years back, Visualizing this situation, Almighty Allah stated in the Noble Quran that when your age parents depend on you, never utter a word of contempt and lower the wings of mercy for them and pray to Allah to shower mercy upon them. I'm concluding. Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance. If you want real peace and tranquility, justice and progress, we have to turn to Islam. Once, a polytheist who hated the Prophet, who wanted to kill our dear messenger, was caught as a prisoner and produced before the messenger of Allah. The Prophet asked him, Tamama, what do you expect from me? He replied in an arrogant tone, If you treat me well, I will be grateful. But if you harm me, I will hate you. The next day also, Tamama was produced. And he repeated the same thing. On the third day, when he was produced, the Prophet said, Tamama, you are free, you can go. Tamama stared at the Messenger of Allah for some time. Then he left that place. He took a bath. And he came back where the Prophet was. Then he proclaimed, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Then he said, O oh Muhammad, till yesterday you were the person whom I hated most. Today you are the person whom I love most. Till yesterday Islam was the religion that I hated most. Today Islam is the only religion dear to me. Till yesterday this was the country I hated most. Today this is the country that I love most. Think about this. The importance of forgiveness, patience. 
That is what Islam teaches us. After this, I understand there is a short and a brief question and answer session. Kindly ask questions relevant to the topic. And I repeat, judge my answers on the basis of Quran and Sunnah. And if any answer is in conflict with Quran and Sunnah, it is your duty to discard my answer and accept Quran and Sunnah. And further, if I'm unable to answer any question, it is my limitation and not the limitation of Islam. May Allah bless you, Allahumma. For the mu'minin wal mu'minat wal muslimin wal muslimat, Allahumma hina lal kitabi wa sunnah wa mitina wal imani wa tawbah. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana dan wa kina rada abana. As-salamu alaykum. Inshallah, now we shall have a round of questions from the audience. Any questions from the audience, we're going to take it in a serial order. First with the mic in the center, the second mic on my right, and then a question from the sisters. Shall we have the first question from mic number one, please? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Nayab Shah. I'm originally from Pakistan, currently working here. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, towards the end of your spe uh, uh, speech that we have to turn to the Islam. That's how we're going to get justice. Now, one of the 99 names Allah has, one of it is Al-Hakam. So we have to accept and submit to Allah as Al-Hakam. And I know from yesterday that you are also linked to the law because you're the advocate, right? My question is accepting any other law yes. except for the law given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it acceptable for Allah? Isn't it not saying goodbye to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Al-Hakam? Yes. My brother has asked a very relevant question. Because there is a section among Muslims which interpret that thee alone we worship. So regarding the worship, Certain scholars say the worship has got another meaning that is obedience. That means we can only obey Allah. So if we accept any rules other than the law given by Allah that is equivalent to shirk, that is not what our dear Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us worship and obedience are not synonymous because the Prophet said during the time of Hajj that in Mecca Iblis will not be worshipped but he will be obeyed so worship is one obey it is not equivalent we have to obey Allah that's a different thing. But what these scholars, with due respect, I disagree with them, says obedience and worship are one. Out of all the prophets, except very few prophets like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Musa alayhi salam, David alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, the others were not rulers. What about Yusuf? Alayhi salam. What about Yusuf alayhi salam? He was a minister and a non-Muslim ruler. But nobody said that he had committed shirk. The Prophet had not given such an interpretation to the meaning of ibadah that it is obedience. For example, take the country like India in my country. Nothing prevents me to perform my duties as a Muslim. My country does not say that I should not pray. My country does not say that I should commit shirk. My country does not say that I should not pay zakat. I should gamble. I should commit adultery. I can live as a true Muslim in my country. And if my country says you should obey the economic laws, where is shirk in it? If my country says these are the traffic rules, 
These are the rules. For example, in UAE, the government says, these are the traffic rules. If I, desig if I obey the traffic rules, where is shirk in it? So in fact, with due respect, my friend, this ideology, I do not want to name the scholars who propagated this. I believe that it is a, a deviation according to my understanding. You can have research because in the question and answer session I said you can judge the answers on the basis of the Quran and Sunnah. You can judge yourself. But this important thing that you can only obey the rules of Allah in, in, in a narrow sense. In fact, that had sowed the seeds of extremism and terrorism. We had to worship Allah. We had to obey the commandments of Allah. But to interpret to mean that we only worship you and we only obey you is not what Allah has taught us and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has interpreted. Zakallah. Sorry, my. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we have very limited on time, and I'm very apologize. We're gonna. We can set up. A but it didn't with answer you. my question because I was not asking about yakan abdu yakan asain. I mentioned the name al hakam, which means the lawgiver and the one who gives. The, not only the lawgiver, but his law is the supreme law. And as he said, uh, that it has to be in, in accordance. Uh, to now, like I can give one example. The punishment for adultery in Quran is very clearly mentioned. It's webs. Right? And any government or any rule or any law that changes that punishment, which is very clearly mentioned in Quran, and that new law supersedes the law given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at first place, that's what my question actually, so it wasn't about Abdiyat or Yaqan Abdu. Yes. Yaqan Astain. Can I answer? Um, we're very limited on time, but I would prefer if, if you can quickly make that point there. What my friend has now is interpreted his question in a different manner. For example, the punishment for adultery. The rules, laws are there of Allah. First of all, a duty of a Muslim is to accept the oneness of Allah and try to be a true believer with the limitations which he is living in a particular country. But if we insist, unless and until these rules are made applicable, we cannot live as a true Muslim. That is not what Quran and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us. For example, in my country in India, in fact, after Indonesia, India has got largest number of Muslim population. What about a criminal act? When a, a group of people indulge in a criminal act, there will be Muslims, Christians, Hindus, etc. in that gang. Often we can find religious uh, tolerance there among criminals in that regard. How to conduct a criminal proceedings? And all these people had jointly killed another person. Should there be a different criminal trials for Muslims, Hindus, Christians, etc.? That's not possible. So the laws and everything, it's just like a big building, Islam. The foundation is Tawheed. The pillars are the belief in the world hereafter. There are a number of rooms and the laws are one room. But if you put that room, that law, as the most important thing, then it will make other things impossible. Jazakallah khair. Uh, due to limited time, we're cutting short on the question and answers. Uh, but we thank you for your enlightening talk and Jazakallah khairan for patient listening. Quran is a revelation from Almighty Allah and Islam is the religion acceptable to Allah. And Islam is the only religion that teaches man what is justice and what is injustice. How can a true Muslim commit atrocities even against enemies when the glorious Quran says in chapter 5 verse 8 Let not your hatred make you depart from justice and commit atrocities If we want real peace and tranquility Justice and progress We have to turn to Islam